Hey everybody, James Balsano here, and you're watching Live Out Your Head! Well, welcome to the Station of Decapitation. Without your head, I'm Nasty Neal. I'm Treacherous Trista. And we're here with the fine people from You Cannot Kill David Arquette, which is playing at Fantasia. We have directors David Darg, who's in the ring right now, yeah. and oh, Bryce James. So. Oh, oh my gosh, so. the guy. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, very good. Uh, so who actually, uh, who approached who to make the, the documentary? Was this something that, that David wanted to do or you guys wanted to do? Yeah, David wanted to do it. Um, he went, well, he wanted to do the project as in he wanted his redemption at, for, in wrestling. So he wanted to go on this journey from zero to hero uh, and fortunately had the foresight to know that it would make a great story. And so approached us uh, as filmmakers and it was like a no-brainer. Um, you know, I'd known David for 10 years but didn't know up until the point that he approached me with the idea that he had been world champion. I loved, you know, Price and I both loved wrestling as kids, but we sort of grew away from it. And so that, I just had never known that fact about David. And so it was such an amazing starting point for the story for me to be like, what? <laughs> and I think a lot of people that aren't wrestling fans uh, are going to approach this film with that same shock. They're like, what are you talking about? David Arquette was world champion. And yeah. so it was such a great starting point for us to then build the story out from there. Uh, and yeah, it was his idea. He wanted to make a love letter to wrestling. You know, the whole project was him saying, I'm sorry, <laughs> please forgive me. I love wrestling. I didn't mean to do it in the first place. Uh, and, and I think what Price and I did as filmmakers was say, okay, we get that. We're going to film that, but we also want to go a, li a little bit deeper here and unpack some of the things in your personal life that are driving you to really do this. And I think that's what makes it such a complete, uh, amazing story in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a lifetime wrestling fan, so I, I remember him as world champion. And I also, in addition to the horror show, I also host a, a weekly wrestling podcast since 2005. And so I know that uh, a lot of the hardcore wrestling fans and uh, old school wrestlers like were not fans of David Arquette becoming world champion. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's something I guess we, we knew that the diehard fans would, would know about the story, but the story still had to work. Uh, right. to non non wrestling fans as 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 a simplistic you know hero's journey as a sort of an everyman even t stripping away the celebrity and those kind of those layers but just making it about a person wanting to better themselves overcome some you know some addiction problems um, the f the fear of celebrity fading what happens when that you know what happens when you age in Hollywood so that we knew that there were all these like really interesting layers that we could feed in. And just by him granting us like so much access and like intimacy with him and his family and you know, all the Arquettes were amazing. And we knew that we we're gonna have, you know, even from the outset, as, as far as us making a sort of redemptive hero's journey, that we'd have this incredible story. Um, so as filmmakers, yeah, it was just like, and exploring the sort of Americana of wrestling and, you know, digging in into these grassroots. He was world champion, like when it was on the, you know, big time on, on uh, Nitro was on, you know, one of the top, top rated cable companies. But the stuff you're showing is a lot, you know, it was a lot different world. And were you Definitely. familiar with that world at all? Like backyard wrestling, you know, and independent wrestling and the Lucha Libre? Yeah, because Price and I are obsessed with counterculture in general. And so we just knew the quirks that that world offered, the, the beauty of it and the craziness of it, it really excited us to, to explore some of that. I think for me, I had no idea how deep the independent wrestling scene ran, especially in America. I mean, the fact that every weekend there's these shows all across America from like just a handful of people in the backyard to like a, a hundred people in like a village hall somewhere, that that's happening every day, every weekend in America, it just blew my mind. Um, just how, how deep wrestling runs in America's blood. It's like, how many people are wrestling fans out there? I had no idea, but it's huge. So since it is, you know, uh, rest, wrestlers are in it and it's about wrestling, which wrestling itself blends reality and fiction. When you're, you know, talking to the wrestlers and you're doing this, uh, does it ever go through your mind how much of this is real and how much of it is for, you know, for show? I guess knowing that, you know, I mean, when I was 10 years old, I saw – uh, Jay the Snake put a snake on Macho Man's arm and it caused real blood and I, my, my fucking brain exploded. It was, With you know, cobra. I was yeah. like, uh, yeah, it was like, that's some real shit. 
so when you when the kind of story sped in about you know oh it's 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 like theatrical and stuff obviously there's a sort of and a kind of carpet pull from like a kind of santa claus moment as a kid but when you kind of come back to it and appreciate it as an adult and the sort of the kind of the storyline the cabaret the comedy of the indie scene and the kind of people doing it for real passion you know like there's no money in it it's like it's we're putting on a show and it's going to be barbaric hilarious and we're going to invent our own. All the characters, I think, are a bit more interesting in the indie scene because you have, you have more control. You've got, like, you're not dictated by some, some corporate script writers. So for us to dig into that indie scene was kind of like, it was like exploring a, a real world. And, and as far as wrestlers being in on the sort of, they, all the wrestlers were amazing because they granted us access. We, they gave us some trust. So especially in the Hollywood scene, um, and the bar wrestling scene in Hollywood, Virginia, Lucha, everyone just knew that we were along for the ride and we, want, and we wanted them to treat David like a, an everyman and just put him through the, put, put him through the paces, take, let him take the bumps. And, um, and they did that. And they were just, they were cool, man. Everyone was so cool. It's been like the best ride ever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, does it ever go through your mind when David's talking about like he wants to be taken seriously and he's doing stuff like dressing up like as a wizard. Like, I know you're, you're making the documentary, so, you, you know, you want to film it, but at the same time, do you ever, I don't know, like, how close you are with him, do you ever want to say, like, maybe that's not the best way to be taken serious? <laughs> no, we're actually really close with him now. Like, he's become a dear, dear friend, especially, you know, on this journey that we all went through together on this film. But, look, David's, like, none of that was, was you know, Dave, that's David's real personality coming through. That's how he acts day to day. And for us, I mean, it was just so funny to see how this guy is in his real life. But it is a struggle because people don't take him seriously. But that is him. Like, he needs to be taken seriously. And I think the film is going to help people realize that, oh, that's the real David Arquette once and for all. And I think it's going to help his career ultimately. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the indie scene, what was just like, well, I know there's one, the, the next scene. But what, what were just some of the craziest things that popped, like that you saw, like you just didn't expect to see? Oh man, street wrestling in Tijuana, dude. I mean, for us, we we had, we had sort of met, we'd um, researched, uh, you know, characters we could we could sort of uh, David could train with. And but when we got to Mexico, we had we had a plan of what we, what we, we would be shooting uh, quintessentially. But when we get there, they're like, "Yeah, so our buddies are doing street wrestling." And we're like, "What? <laughs> what is street wrestling?" Um, they're like, "Yeah, it's like." It's, it's basically quintessentially begging or busking at a traffic light with traffic stopped in like eight lanes of traffic. And we're like, okay, so talk about us going into the deep end as, you know, we are, I'm basically there with, um, you know, we got cops driving past in the middle of traffic. We were complete like guerrilla gun and running and talk about fear and fraud. You know, we're in the middle of traffic and trying to get like these amazing shots, shooting slow motion, trying to make it look epic as if it was a sort of Tony Scott sequence, you know, in the middle of like chaos. And that for me was, I mean, that was, that was kind of something on it. Like that's on, that's burnt into my retina. Um, right. for me. So since it was David's idea to do this, like how much input did he have in what you're filming and also what you edit and you know, the final product? Yeah, so it was his idea to go on the journey and to tell the story, but it was very sort of surface layer, that idea. He was like, he knew that he wanted to, like, apologize to the wrestling world uh, and redeem himself in wrestling, but it was very on the surface and matter of fact. And he called it, I want to make a love letter to wrestling, and the film certainly is that, uh, ultimately. But for us, we just, we wanted to unpack and take it much deeper and explore the, the things that he'd struggle with in his personal life, with addiction and things like that, and just show the really dark side of what he's had to struggle with so that the hero's journey in this whole story is more evident ultimately that you realize this isn't just an average person that's struggling to fight his way back to the top that this is someone like literally wrestling with demons as well and so it was it was very tough i think for david to allow us at certain points to like go that deep i don't think he was expecting that this film would necessarily peel himself back that far um, but I think, you know, we did, we did a screening with friends and family, um, a couple of months ago after we wrapped production. And like, I think he finally saw what Price and I were setting out to do and, and appreciates it and ultimately in the end. Uh, Trissa, did you have a question? I am also a wrestling fan and particularly an indie wrestling fan. And I also work in indie film. 
So I see a lot of parallels in those two businesses, and I was wondering if you guys uh, could speak on that, if that resonates for you as well. As far as the sequences, sorry? Uh, the comparison between the indie, indie wrestling world and the uh, indie um, movie world. I mean, I guess it's, 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 in a, in a nutshell, it's on screen. You've got, because of, um, I think, when, you, when you're filming uh, with personalities who are in a grassroots industry and allowing you full access, I think there's, there's a sense of um, intimacy and, I guess, realness that comes through. You know, it's, we're not dictated by corporations and, like, having to adhere to sort of, uh, you know, you can film up to here, but you can't go past here. And like the whole point of this film was to kind of strip away some of those illusions of what wrestling is and, you know, how we construct a match or how we plan through and how no one gets hurt. Like all these things kind of play into the film. Um, as far as indie making, it's just, I think that it's mainly that. I think if, if they, if they don't give you the money, they can't tell you what to do. And I think that's, that's in a nutshell, what indie wrestling and indie filmmaking is. You know, if you, if you have complete freedom, you're going to get something authentic and real on screen. And that's what we think is in the film. Yeah. And it was very like do it yourself in the indie world. Like the wrestlers would like fight the matches and then they would go and work the merch table themselves and like interact with the fans. Right. And so it did feel very much like indie filmmaking that like there's no one was precious about anything. You have to like wear multiple hats. Um, and the creativity is very different. Like Price said, you know, you don't have someone high up controlling it. Like you get to control the script. Um, and have a lot of fun with it. And so, like, the wrestling world, they have a lot of fun in the indie scene. And I think indie consumers of indie wrestling are, are the, like, I think, a very similar crowd as well. And I was like, that was one thing that really surprised me about the indie scene. And the, it, it was the crowd. Like, it was so diverse. Like, people from all walks of life that you wouldn't expect to come together otherwise were coming together to, like, watch wrestling. Like, people of different races and cultural backgrounds and, like, classes were just all there because they loved wrestling and, like, like uh, this common love for wrestling it was a really beautiful thing to see. What's with David's giant, uh, giant furniture and giant uh, tennis? Ah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's 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 just one of his another one of his, like you know eccentricities and his quirks. You know when he when he said, "Oh, this is when we went into storage and we saw him with a giant tennis rack." I was like, "Right, you got to play tennis right now." And then that <laughs> kind of fed through. I guess part of the metaphor of the Peter Pan syndrome for, right. for, for us was a yeah. Because that, that was good editing because it, it comes into when he talks about not wanting to grow up. Yeah, exactly. And also you've got him in that chair playing the ukulele, which again... Yeah, it's the tiny like, ukulele in the giant chair. <laughs> yeah, it looks like, yeah, it's like a child just lost dreaming about what could be. And I think because that's just before his ascent into the sort of fantasy world and his, his kind of commitment, it was really nice to see that as a sort of, I guess it was a man-child or it was Peter Pan. Um, and ironically, the fantasy saves his real life. So, I mean, you know, it, it all, you know, we knew that once we had those layers and those visuals that could kind of define him as a character, as a person, um, mm -hmm. they would all come into play. And yeah, I, I, I like that you mentioned that. It's like, we still <laughs> laugh about the, the, the giant fucking tennis racket. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> He's like, oh, I've got, I've got this. Is this any use? I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I know we're getting close to time here. What went through your your mind uh, when you, in the next scene when he gets cut really bad? And I don't spoil anything, but I knew all about this because it was all the talk on the, uh, on the in the wrestling world at the time. Yeah, so it's a tough scene to film because he's obviously a very good friend, and whenever you see a friend in that much distress, it's really difficult. But as filmmakers, we also knew that what we were capturing in that moment was such a critical part of his story. Because what it represented, and when you see the film, I'm not going to give too much away, but when you see the film, David almost dies. And that, to us, was like, this is someone that's so committed to this story and to the redemption that he's seeking that he's willing to lay his life down for it. And that's very deep, and obviously, like, you just got to keep the cameras rolling at that point. But yeah, I came away from that night picking glass out of my hair, covered in David's blood. Like, it was real, very, very real and raw. Um, and I think as filmmakers, we're lucky that we were able to c capture that kind of stuff ultimately because that's what makes towards a powerful story. Well, I think that goes to like what I said at the beginning, like uh, how much of the, how, in the wrestling world, how much, you know, how much of this is real and stuff. And then at that point, it's like, well, how much of this is fun? Now it's, you know, th it's not just this, this fun, crazy thing, him dressing as a wizard at this point. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, you guys have got a horror podcast 
I think that scene turns this documentary into a horror film. And so like, we're actually kind of happy about that because we wanted to explore all the different genres of wrestling. And like David obviously has a huge background as a horror actor as well. And so like for him to sort of be in a real life horror was definitely a parallel that we wanted to explore. We never really imagined we'd be able to explore it that deeply, but like it's very meta. The whole film is very meta. If you think about his background as a horror actor and the fact that he's living out real life horror scenes in that, in that moment is pretty interesting. Well, uh, you cannot kill David Arquette at Fantasia. And then if you want to see what happens after that, uh, you guys have a website and everything. So check that out. But uh, I appreciate you guys both being on the show with us. Yeah, we're stoked. Thanks, Tristan. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And good luck with Thanks, the Thanks, Tristan. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.